I request Chairman Sir and Matt to please come on the dais. Request Chairman Sir to welcome Matt with a flower bouquet. Chairman Aski, Shri K. Padmana Bhaiya, uh, Matt O'Keefe, Head of O-Power, distinguished guests, students, faculty colleagues, and staff, and people who have joined our YouTube, a warm welcome. I am Nirmalia Bakchi. I am the Director General in Charge of Administrative Staff College of India. It gives me great pleasure to welcome <coughs> Matt O'Keefe, to our campus. Uh, as you are all well aware, Administrative Staff College has been a center where a lot of policy decisions and policy research happens, especially in the area of energy management, energy policies, tariff setting of different state governments. And we work on <clears throat> the various energy transition uh, policies of different governments. And uh, <clears throat> And uh, in that respect, uh, the energy transition also requires a lot of uh, very, very intricate and complex work on IT management issues. And that is why it gives me great pleasure to welcome Matt. And hopefully, he will throw some light on the complexities. We were discussing over lunch the various complexities that are there in installing renewable energy sources. and, and going through that transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy and uh, incredibly complex work and we need a really solid IT background. It also comes at a good time. Uh, yesterday itself, uh, uh, the Honorable Minister of Telangana, Shri KTR Garu has announced that Hyderabad will also have uh, a, a, a mobility uh, valley uh, where there will be a lot of companies which will be incubated, who will work on electric mobility, battery storage, and also perhaps on IT solutions. Uh, <clears throat> it's customary for me to give a little bit of background of our speaker today. So <clears throat> I'll just read out. Mac O'Keefe is the head of O-Power, a part of Oracle Energy and Water. O-Power is the world's leading behavioral energy efficiency, ESM, and customer engagement platform. In this role, he sets the strategic direction and oversees the global operations of O-Power. O-Power's committed team members work with O-Power's customers around the globe to develop and implement energy efficiency, demand response, customer engagement, and smart grid projects. To date, O-Power software has saved over <coughs> 33 trillion watt hours of energy helping utilities meet climate change goals. He has served on the board of directors of the California Efficiency and Demand Management Council since 2017, and previously on the board of directors of the Canadian Energy Efficiency Alliance from 2014 onwards. Prior to joining OPower, Matt worked with leaders of energy efficiency businesses, investor-owned utilities, and regulatory bodies to expand and stabilize the market for efficiency focused companies while at California Energy Efficiency Industry Council. His work in the efficiency industry was informed by various positions in municipal government, nonprofits, politics, and education. He is a former <coughs> uh, uh, Teach for America Corps member and has degrees from University of California, Los Angeles, and the George Washington University. He lives in Oakland, California with his wife and daughter. So with these few words, I welcome you once again. And before I request Matt to deliver his address, I now request our chairman to give his opening remarks. Sir.
good evening ladies and gentlemen uh i join my director general in warmly welcoming our distinguished guests uh mr keep and uh, you heard about his uh, uh, cv so he is a very distinguished man in this particular field i just wanted to mention that energy transition um is being talked about all over the world i mean how to but it is a very complex process how do you switch over from coal and uh, hydrocarbon economy which to which you have been accustomed for so many years so many generations and to something else you know the transition and it is more difficult for the developing countries uh, which are basically you know there is india has got huge deposits of coal so obviously you have to exploit the coal and of course we are not as as good in the hydrocarbons but still so switching over is a very painful very costly and very complex process you know we talk about in management about change management you know just changing some people from one desk to another also is a difficult job now you have to change the entire scenario you know from one particular uh, uh, this one paradigm to another paradigm completely so it's very complex and technology plays a great role in many areas one is in uh, the manufacture of batteries itself which are based on very rare earth minerals which are monopoly of certain countries in the world now and the second one is uh on the solar panels you know every day there is a lot of change going on in the solar panels how do you make more and more efficient solar panels and the third one is the electrical Uh, vehicle manufacture itself these are all very very important uh, similarly technologies relating to the so called carbon uh, capture utilization and storage uh, very fascinating but very complex again so these are all there i never knew that uh, the carbon is trapped and then taken under the sea and then you know put inside the sea somewhere about how many meters about 500 meters or so down so and then to be uh retrieved later if necessary you know so it is something i did not know at all so i believe uh, coming to mr okif his work is at the utility and the consumer level and his focus is on uh, ai in which he is an expert and on behavioral sciences there is a great combination in these two you know uh, he thinks that small changes made in en masse uh, across the populations can achieve great results for the uh, country or for the economy and the decarbonization i am very eager to listen to him and i'm sure you are equally eager so i welcome him uh, to this evening speech thank you i i think this will work thank you um good afternoon Thank you so much for having me here um and hearing your CV read next to such distinguished individuals uh, uh it's quite remarkable and I I will say I have to make one correction to that which was that um I have a wife and a daughter and one more on the way in just 6 weeks so I will be flying back to San Francisco pretty quickly after this cuz I'm cutting it pretty close um thank you so much for having me here today I think you'll see throughout this presentation that you're looking at a deeply optimistic person but someone who is obsessed with understanding whether or not our actions are having an impact. And so throughout my presentation today, I want to make sure that we are thinking about the small things, thinking about the technology, thinking about the future, but being honest about results we're seeing um and thinking about our collective impact as often as possible. I got into energy efficiency uh because I heard about um this incredible situation when I was very young. In the late 1970s, California was in a position that India is in today, which was to say we saw a line that looked like this about our future demand for energy. There was an endless expectation that we would keep growing our demand for energy in the state of California to a point that we could not even uh stop the line. It just went up and to the right on the graph over and over again. In looking at this, the power planners in the state assumed we would need a nuclear power plant every 
50 miles down the coast of the entire state to meet the demand that was expected by the year 2050. This was um, not acceptable to people at the time to imagine that amount of development at our pristine coastline. And at that time, uh, a number of people, including Art Rosenfeld, created this idea of energy efficiency. The idea that we can actually count on using less uh, by decreasing demand with programs. So with that, I dove in um, and spent my uh, most of my career thinking about how we can collectively think about the programs, uh, the, the interventions, the technologies to reduce demand. Um, and I have now spent the last 10 years working at Opower, a unique company in this space because we believe the demand is in all of our hands. So let me dive in. There we go. Okay. Um, decarbonization is one of the most um, incredible opportunities and the biggest challenges we have in the world. Uh, decarbonizing our energy supply, though, is going to be a massive undertaking. We see incredible net zero commitments made around the world by 2030, 2050, 2070 here in India. But let's not pretend like it's not an incredible amount of work. Trillions of dollars will be spent major sacrifices will be made as we do that. Um, and we're going to do it with incredible technology. You have a remarkable ascent of solar, uh, both on utility scale, um, you have it on rooftops, it is showing up everywhere around the world. The proliferation of solar will do so much for us, but require a lot from us as individuals as well. You're seeing LEDs replacing um, uh, lighting across the world with energy uh, intensity that is so much smaller than we ever imagined. Wind turbines powering the entire grid in, in states and countries in ways we never expected. And lithium ion batteries actually finally getting to the point where we believe that we can have emissions-free transportation for as many people as possible. Um, I, I know that I personally just procured an electric vehicle and I couldn't be more proud to have no more emissions, although I'm driving a little bit more recklessly because it's so fun to drive. Um, but with all of this technology, I'm not an expert on any of these things. I know a lot about it, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about this. And it's the power of people to achieve our decarbonization targets and the, necess uh, the necess necessary activity and engagement we all need to do as people in the public sector, as people in the energy sector, as people in the utility sector to pay attention and ask for a lot from the individuals in our communities, in our states, in our countries, because the potential is massive. I want to show you something very interesting we uncovered in the US. A couple of, uh, about a year ago, we sought out to understand just how much actually there is of an impact on decarbonization in the energy sector from various investments. And so in looking at the projected uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, it was broken into five categories. In the red, that is industrial emissions. In the orange, it is emissions from commercial needs. In the purple, it's from medium duty and heavy duty vehicles, the trucks that move around our goods, um, the trains that move around our goods. The so light blue is light duty vehicles, the motorcycles, um, the, we don't have tuk-tuks in America, unfortunately, so it's not counted, but our, our, our four wheel uh, vehicles, the cars you have in a home, and then the residential sector. Almost 40% of all emissions in the United States comes from these two categories I wanna highlight residential and, um, and, and, and um, vehicles, electric vehicles that a residential customer would have. This is fascinating and scary because we can place policy, we can make major demands on the red, the orange, and the purple, but moving individual decision-making is incredibly hard. So we went out to understand just what exactly can be done here. And it's remarkable and scary and exciting that the customer action pathways, that is the sectors where customers have to act or where we have 40% of our emission reductions. And that's not just true in the US, that's true everywhere around the world. So we, I wanted to dive in a little bit more on that. 
and understanding what we can do to control it. Take a look at this chart here. The top line without the colors, imagine the colors aren't there, is what the emissions would be expected to, to be in the US over the next 20 years. The red part is us greening the grid, bringing those renewables, bringing on the, uh, bringing on the solar, bringing on hydro, bringing on more and more wind. That pink or that red is how much we could reduce our emissions. So that's remarkable. We have to do that. We're going to do that. But layering on top of that is how much emissions we can reduce from that top line, which would be if we had no intervention. The blue is energy efficiency, and that green is electric vehicles. That shows that the customer action package, those areas that we, we control as consumers, um, will result in 534 um, uh, MMTs of emission reductions by 2040. Whereas greening the grid alone, the decisions that power planners make, the decisions that utilities and states make, has a huge impact of 284 MMTs, but it's half as much as the decisions that we all make. So with that in mind, let's talk about what those decisions are. And this isn't even all of them. It is deciding to um, uh, make your homes more efficient with increased lighting and better, uh, better air conditioning, uh, more uh, changing behavior in your home. It's also improving the efficiency of your HVAC systems or where there's gas um, heating a lot in the US, gas water heating. It is buying an electric vehicle and using that in, a, in an efficient way as opposed to using um, a, an ICE vehicle. It is purchasing solar for behind the meter on your home, on your apartment, on your uh, commercial building, and it's changing your space heating. With all of that together, there is a remarkable amount of avoided emissions, equivalent to closing half of all of the coal power plants in America. Choices we can make, and choices on the way we interact in our homes. This to me is deeply empowering and scary. And I go back to scary one more time, it's an important word, because these are things that cannot be changed just with code changes or policy changes. These are individual homes, people choosing to spend their money, people choosing to take action inside of those homes and buildings and in the choices they make with their cars. So what I want you to take from that before I dive in deeper is that customer choices, consumer choices alone, can provide two times as much emissions reductions as utility scale investments in greening the energy sector alone. The good news is, as we bring on more, um, uh, more solar, as we bring on more wind, more hydro, all of these decisions actually become greener too, but they become magnified, and that's a remarkable outcome for all of us. So with that in mind, let's move forward, because this gentleman here, uh, Paul Lau, leads one of the most important utilities in the United States called SMUD. It's not large, but it is incredibly important because they experiment. They are a public sector utility that wants to do the best for their customers, and he is unstoppable in his recognition that customers, consumers, they are at the center of this conversation. We cannot just be in the back rooms at our administrative offices making power planning decisions or policy decisions. You have to think about how customers will interact. And in working with him and others like him, we've, we have a big challenge ahead of us. When you look at North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific, people are ready to achieve that challenge though of investing in distributed energy resources. This is things like solar. Um, this is things like storage at your home, like batteries. This is electric vehicles. And if you see, distributed energy resources will grow most dramatically in Asia Pacific, uh, but they are going to make a huge impact on all of our grid. Um, and almost all of that, the yellow part, is in the residential sector. It's not at businesses. It's not at commercial, uh, uh, commercial institutions. It's at home. So that is scary because all of us have to make decisions. Your neighbors, your brother that you wouldn't trust to make a decision, your, uh, your, your cousin or your coworker that you don't always like the way they make decisions, they're gonna have to make good ones. We wanna help out with that. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about my company for just one second because Opower believes strongly that we have to tackle this scary reality head first. And that is with three really important things. We have to increase awareness. Before you can ask people to do something, you have to help them understand. How are you consuming your energy? What actually uh, uses the most energy in your home? 
Would it be smart for you to convert from gas to electric? Um, when do you use during the day? When do you not use? How much do your neighbors use to understand whether or not you are an outlier in how much you use? So we use awareness campaigns and nudges to drive people to understand. Then we help drive people towards the adoption of better tools. We're helping people think through, okay, if I'm going to get a, um, uh, a new air conditioner, let me make sure I understand that maybe that one costs 20% more, but operating it costs 50% less over its life because it's more efficient. We help people think about the right light bulbs to purchase, how to upgrade their hot water heating, et cetera. And then the holy grail has always been this last one, automation. So get that hot water heater that shuts off when you're not using it. Get that thermostat that's smarter than you. Um, adopt a, a technology that is going to be able to be controlled centrally as a distributed energy resource. But I want to share a story with you. This woman here is doing the exact right thing. She purchased and installed a smart thermostat. These incredibly um, helpful tools that learn about the way that you consume in your home. They help you get the ideal temperature. They know when to effectively turn up and turn down to make sure you're not too hot, not too cool. They know when you're home and you're not home. These are going to change the whole world for us, particularly in the United States, about the way we use our air conditioning and heating. Utilities, regulators, states were paying for them to be installed all across the country. Could not be more excited to have them. We were assuming massive energy efficiency opportunities. But unfortunately, we found out that while they're helpful for reducing demand, these smart thermostats, these incredibly powerful devices, um, have not actually resulted in efficiency. They've resulted in increased comfort in the home. They've resulted in um, uh, uh, many changes that could be efficient if they're kept at the set points. And let's talk about some of the outcomes here. Using a randomized field experiment, again, that, that evaluation to make sure we think it's right. Looking at millions of energy use records across an 18 month period across millions of homes, leading researchers in our field uncovered that there is little evidence that thermostats, smart thermostats, have a statistically or economically significant effect on energy use. This was devastating for so many of us in the industry to undercover that, because this was the technology that was gonna solve things. We found out that even though the marketers had said there would be such a change for all of us in our efficiency in our homes, we'd save money, reduce emissions, that in fact, there's a problem. And that's that, that woman's son, that woman's husband, the other people in the home, because they override the actual settings of the thermostat. They change it to what they want in the time. Because we can have the smartest thermostat in the world. We can have the most incredible technology, but people are still using it. And so what we forgot about was you can't just set a thermostat and expect that it's going to magically change the way you consume. There are other people in your home, and maybe you too have had disagreements with your husband or wife or children about how they've set the thermostat, but the human element overcame the technology. And it's with that in mind that I go back to that word scary, because if this magical device can't solve things, what are we going to do? So let's go back to this. Awareness, automation, and adoption. We came back to it and realized that you can't just build this pyramid and end at adoption, uh, end at automation. You've got to come back and have ongoing direct engagement. Coach people, nudge them, have an ongoing conversation to remind them of the power of the technology that they have. I'm just going to provide a couple examples. And they seem small. But they are all based upon one important thing, which is the utility at the center, just like you have here, that is either state-owned or regulated, that has a customer-centric model that we are transitioning from the idea that you just have to plan for power, plan for distribution, plan for that transmission, and then people will just consume equally. Instead, we have to think about how exactly they're consuming, and I believe that they themselves, the consumers, are a resource. And I can say this because of this following statistic. It was read earlier uh, by the Director General, but I, I'm going to say it again because it's astounding. Since 2008, by just 
asking people to conserve with personalized information at their homes um, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, sometimes via email, sometimes text message, sometimes pieces of paper. We have worked with our utility clients to save with 1 billion home energy reports sent around the world, over 35 terawatt hours of energy. 35 terawatt hours equivalent to the entire city of Delhi being off the grid for a full year, or Mumbai plus Bangalore. It's also equivalent to the entire, the, to 1% of the entire residential demand in the United States. We haven't paid anyone a dime. We haven't forced anyone to do anything. We've just asked. We've asked at the right time. Um, and you know, I I get chill thinking about that because when the company was started, no one imagined that one percent of the residential demand of the entire United States would be decreased just by asking people with some targeted messages in their home. So let's take that and let's double it. Let's triple it. Let's quadruple it. But I want to first go micro and show you some examples. So one thing that is, is, is changing the way that people consume energy is time of use rates. Where smart meters are proliferating, um, where they are becoming more common, more and more utilities are providing rates that are more and more equivalent to the cost of actually procuring energy at that time. In some districts, you might pay more in the afternoon if there is high demand in the afternoon, or less if solar penetration is so high, like in California, in the afternoon, early afternoon, it's actually the cheapest part of the day. Um, and these time of use programs are quite remarkable. They do get people to shift their usage um, in ways that are both impressive and also um, not too punitive, but they can lead to pretty high bills. Um, at Southern California Edison, a utility serving about 20 million customers in Los Angeles, um, demand programs have been launched and behavioral interventions to deal with this incredible thing called the duck curve. This is the idea that um, as renewable power is, is incredibly proliferant on the, on, the, um, on the grid, there's a quick drop because the sun goes down. And it's at that time that power is the hardest to procure in California. So we've run some programs. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. On the left is a chart that shows us actually the relationship between price response and price ratio when it comes to time of use rates. On the left is the impact on the reduction of usage at peak. Um, and on the right is the cost differential or the ratio of the peak price to off peak price. So for instance, if it is equivalent of 10 cents American dollar per kilowatt hours at night and 20 cents uh, during the peak period, that'd be a two. If it's 10 cents at night and 40 cents in the afternoon, that'd be a four. And the blue line down below is the impact on demand reduction um, if they're, um, without any overlay of technology. Pretty good. It gets people to shift their usage at those times. But then on the top, when you overlay technology, that smart thermostat or automating your EV load, you see a bigger impact. But on the right is something even more special. We worked with Southern California Edison, and this is the outcome of that. This is with people with time of use rates, comparing a control group and a treatment group, we saw a marked change where we just told people and asked people to change their consumption during those peak periods. So where you see that people are staying at the 0%, then they drop down uh, more than 1% during the peak periods. So it wasn't just the price. It wasn't just the device. It also was behavior change. It can drive additional change during that period. So we're launching bigger and bigger programs to use people's um, opportunity to save even higher and let them uh, make their own choice about what they want to do. Um, we do that by sending out emails or text messages or via WhatsApp, um, a chart that shows you how much you use during those peak periods, what the appliances are being used, because we disaggregate that information and give you tips about what you can do and then people make those changes. I also want to talk about electrification and the drive to get as many people to have EVs as possible. In North America right now, EV penetration has been pretty slow to grow. Um, even just two years ago, we saw leading researchers saying that people just aren't even thinking about it. But in the last year, two major things have happened. One, we had a major piece of legislation passed 
that is providing huge economic incentives for people to buy electric vehicles. And two, the state of California, which is often the leader in the US, made it, um, and by 2035, no internal combustion engine vehicles can be sold in the state. By 2035, only 12 years from now, every vehicle must be electric. So that is starting to massively change how quickly we are moving up in um, the uh, proliferation of electric vehicles. We wanted to work with some of our, our customers though, because they're having a hard time with this massive new load coming on board. They didn't have time to replan their distribution, replan their generation to meet the needs. And like many things, there are clusters where people get EVs, you're more likely to have an EV if your neighbor got one than in another neighborhood where someone does not have one. We have a clustering of them. So we worked with National Grid, and National Grid, the major uh, UK and North American utility, um, to help get people to start to charge at different times. National Grid doesn't have AMI. They don't have advanced metering infrastructure or smart grid and smart meters. They just have monthly reads. So we had to use some sensors to determine this but we couldn't use time of use pricing. People could not be penalized for, for um, using their, or charging their electric vehicles uh, during a peak period. So we ask, and over 10% of people shifted their usage to times that are completely appropriate for the grid. You're seeing um, really unique apps being developed. This is not a product that we have, but I wanted to share that even without smart meters, people are coming up with unique programs. Um, they are providing incentives to tell you about when is the greenest time on the grid to actually plug in your um, electric vehicle, or how you can save money by actually getting a submeter at your home and other unique programs. But all of these require people to actually jump in and decide to do this because it can't be forced upon them. I also want to go ahead and talk about energy efficiency. As I described at the outset, um, energy efficiency to me is the reason why I started to do this work. But to get a country like India to be more efficient, you're building a whole new country right now. There are cr cranes in the sky everywhere. You're building an entire new uh, set of offices and homes across the country. We can improve this, the, the codes, improve the standards uh, so that homes are more efficient, that your appliances are more efficient, that your air conditioning is more efficient. In more um, uh, established economies like in the US or Europe, almost everything that will be done is a retrofit of an existing um, almost all of our building stock is already built. And although you have opportunities here as well, this is particularly challenging when you have um, poorly insulated homes that are uh, you know, 50, 70, 100 years old that have live in cold climates, but we're used to cheap energy. And these homes require tens of thousands of US dollars to upgrade. These are complex projects. Um, they are invasive to your home. And People don't want to do that. They don't see the upside to it in the near term for power prices. Um, it just doesn't pencil. So now big subsidies have come. In. And so we're working with uh, companies across the country to figure out how we can actually incentivize folks to do it. We found that efficiency is a helpful message, but comfort is a more helpful message that you'll, your home will be quieter, your air quality will be better, even while you're using less energy. So what we've done is work with some of these companies to drive uh, specific programs to specific individuals. We know about what's going on in their homes. We know if they have an inefficient air conditioner. We know if their HVAC needs to be replaced or if, they, if their water heater is quite old. We provide those tips and then match them with these rebate programs. These have had a, a huge impact. We've seen places like Smeco in the US state of Maryland uh, see remarkable outcomes, a five times higher increase uh, when you provide behavioral nudges and engage customers to do that. So it's scary to know we need to change every building in the United States, but it's an opportunity and one that we're proud to be a part of. I do want to talk about energy efficiency more specifically for a second. Um, Badr Khan, um, a friend and someone who's very impressive in the utilities industry in the US and the UK, um, will never stop saying this phrase, the core part of energy efficiency, which is that the cheapest kilowatt hour is the one you don't consume and the lowest emitting kilowatt hour is the one you don't emit. And he says this over and over again because power planners and distribution engineers oftentimes don't trust that efficiency can be relied upon, particularly behavioral energy efficiency, and don't assume that people are gonna act as, as positively as they can to actually reduce 
their consumption in the manner they can. And so he made sure to ensure that um, all power planning, all potential studies included the highest amount of energy efficiency possible so that um, generation was not overbuilt. Um, in, in general, we're seeing the biggest regulatory commissions in North America, the International Energy Agency, really doubling down on energy efficiency as a way to achieve our goals across the globe. Um, but it can't just be in the commercial sector. It can't just be with um, industrial applications. We have to do a lot with the residential sector as well. Uh, and people are ready to do that. But I'm gonna give a little bit of a pitch for what we do in particular. Because we've spent years asking people to upgrade their homes to get a more efficient hot water heater or, 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 um, uh, or HVAC system. But structural long-term measures are quite powerful. But the lowest emissions we can possibly have is to reduce things now, particularly before the grid more, gets more green. And the analysis group shocked most people in the US work in efficiency when they determined that it is five times faster and a quarter the cost of structural energy efficiency investments to actually rely upon behavioral, to get people to make their own decisions about the way they use their home. If you look at one apartment building or condominium complex or one subdivision with the same homes, you will see a wild distribution of energy usage, even in the same homes with the same appliances, the same square footage. And all of that is based upon the way that people interact with and engage with the energy in their homes. So knowing that there is such a distribution, we have to provide that ongoing engagement and ongoing um, nudges to keep people um, as efficient as possible. One of the ways we do that is by comparing your usage to neighbors with that same size of home with those same appliances. And people are shocked to find out they're using two times more or three times more than people with the same characteristics in their homes. So you're seeing massive investment in behavior change. It's also really helpful in a, an emerging economy like India because you cannot meet your, your increasing demand without um, uh, decreasing the demand at certain times of day. And it, although expectations like this, we can curve it a little bit uh, by changing how people interact with their appliances. So I wanna talk about what this looks like in reality. So with the carbonization, we can't just have people decrease their overall usage. We need people to decrease their usage at certain times of day. And there's a concept called shape shift shed shimmy, um, which is not the easiest phrase to say. But the idea is to go from years to seconds. So we can shape the load by decreasing overall demand with more efficient appliances. You can shift by having people um, wash their dishes in a dishwasher at different times of day or run their laundry at a different time of day or use their shower. But the demand stays the same, it's just shifted to a different time, maybe of lower emissions. Um, you can shed by getting rid of the load altogether and moving that industry out of the area. Or you can shimmy, have people shift their load around at different times on different days. So maybe on a certain day, we just uh, shed load. We don't have anyone um, or run that manufacturing plant or we use demand side management, demand response during those periods. Um, and that shimmy is uh, a last resort where we're getting rid of down to the down to the minute uh, people asking people to not turn on their dryer for a 15 minute period. This is remarkably effective when managed well, but requires incredible investments in, in, in information technology. At Opower, we know that consumers themselves are as flexible of a resource as a uh, power plant uh, calling upon the manufacturing facility to reduce their usage, for instance. And so um, uh, we look at this as energy efficiency, uh, which is the overall seasonal reduction, variable rates with that time of use rates and the layered behavioral techniques on top of it, um, getting people to participate in demand response events when we send out text messages or phone calls or, or WhatsApp messages to let folks know that today from 4 to 6 p.m. is a high peak day please uh, stay at work longer and don't turn on your air conditioner at home or wait to turn on that load. Um, the hours or the device control, or maybe there's a switch on your air conditioning or we have a switch on your hot water heater or on that th smart thermostat where we actually can control from the central um, monitoring source your um, HVAC usage during an hour period, shut that off for you. Um, and then down to real time, distributed energy resource control 
uh, via DERMS modules. These are incredibly powerful. These are reliable, and many power planners are expecting in the future we'll be deploying these techniques more and more. So as was shared earlier, Oracle, the company that owns Opower, is a massive IT company. And we take this very seriously to know that in order to use people as a resource, you have to have massive investments in IT capabilities. So at the center of most utilities is a customer information system and a meter data management system that takes the reads off the meter. This is incredibly powerful information that is not used very well at this stage. And so on top of that, you can layer things, not just like printing bills or, or getting data to be used for various purposes, but actually combining this with marketing messages to your home, because we know you bought um, a air conditioner 10 years ago. Maybe it's time to get a new one. Or on your home, because we know that you've disaggregated, and it turns out your lighting is way more uh, of your usage than we'd expect. You should be transitioning to LEDs. Um, and combining that with marketing messages, outbound messages, and then providing that data to people who can come to your neighborhood or community um, and actually change, uh, know who to talk to to, to upgrade the, the, the home and, and the various uh, materials and uh, devices in that home. So these massive IT investments are shocking in their expense, but they're absolutely worth it when you think about what it can unlock. In meeting with utility leaders throughout India over the last week, uh, people understand this. Uh, the regulators understand this, uh, but the, the need for advanced metering is oftentimes um, assumed to be in place. You need a smart meter before you can do these programs, and that is not true. What you do need, though, is really powerful tools to engage with um, and, and nudge and constantly push back and forth uh, information to customers. Thank you so much. Just leave you with a, a picture of, of a plant called the Chemise in California that is all over my beloved home state. And um, it's something I think about a lot because this is uh, one of those plants that is, has been looked at for years as um, a marker of how our climate is changing. And they pull these little sprigs and they measure the amount of water in each of these sprigs. And we thought we saw the lowest point we'd ever seen before in the early 2000s, but it's now another 50% less water filled each year than ever been before. And the fires that are now devastating our state are a market reminder of what's happening around the world. Um, and each and every day, I, I can't um, uh, tell you how much of a sense of urgency I feel to address these issues. Um, and all of these issues from fires and pollution uh, to the cost of energy impacts everyone around the world. Um, so let's ask people around the world to do their part and count on them as a resource for efficiency, demand response, um, and changing what we can do in the energy sector. So thank you for spending a little time with me today to hear about the way that we as consumers can engage, the role that utilities can play in the investments we need to make. Thank you very much. Oh, of course, if there's any questions, I would, I would love it. Yes. Yes. Now, what is your experience in India with this uh, yeah. city? Thank you for that question. We've deployed several programs in India. Um, I'll highlight one at uh, BRPL in Delhi. So working with the utility in Delhi, um, we identified several hundred thousand customers uh, to provide outbound messages. So um, emails and pieces of paper that provided um, disaggregated information about what they were using in their home and provided tips about what they could do to change their consumption. We launched it in winter, which is a low, uh, a low electricity usage season in Delhi. We had one summer and then another winter afterwards. During this 18 month period, we got up to 1% um, energy savings. Um, and that was in the first year. We expect it to double in the second year or even triple by the third year. So Indian consumers were reacting just as well as others were around the world. The fascinating thing to me about that was in the middle of the experiment was when there was the announcement of a, a subsidy where up to 200 kilowatt hours a month would not be charged at all. So the price incentive completely went away for a lot of customers. 
yet savings still remain. So even when the subsidy came out and people with under 200 kilowatt hours a month of usage were not paying an electricity bill, they still were saving. And so that's a good reminder of how much people will do even we just ask it. I don't think one, two, three percent is enough. I want to get higher, but I also want to take advantage of the shimmy and the shift we were talking about. I think the demand response programs would be more powerful here. We were asking for the people to save overall, whatever you want to do, but I think deploying um, uh, time specific demand response events during periods of high demand across the country could be even more impactful. <sighs> Great question. We work with the utilities because we take in all of their energy usage data. We understand what home they're serving. And then we import that on our system. And then we um, use our proprietary algorithms to learn from what's going on. And then we present that data back out to the individual customer. So no one asks for the program. You can opt out if you don't want to, but we just are gonna send you information. It's like, imagine getting a bill, but it actually had valuable information for you. Not just how much you owe, but it tells you when you were using, how much you were using, what was, what was driving that usage and what you could do to reduce your consumption. Also, we then match it with things. So for instance, we could promote a new, um, a new efficient um, air conditioner for you because maybe we found that you were using yours more than is normal. Um, or we could promote new lighting for other folks on a different part of the, the communication. So our clients are the utilities. Thank you. I Hi, Matt. Uh, wonderful presentation. My name is uh, Surya Jirigunta. I am a BRICS Chamber of Commerce Energy Convener. And uh, my question is on the behavioral uh, you know, intervention from uh, you know, the company utilities. So when you send these messages, right, uh, which segment of uh, population you're getting positive feedback? Is it residential or commercial? Great because in India, the tariffs are different between commercials and the residential. Yeah. Um, it's been a fascinating um, opportunity working here over the last five, six years because the residential sector has been seen more and more as a, um, with subsidies, it's not a place that utilities and, and, and governments are making a lot of money, right? They make the money from the commercial sector. Yeah. The demand is very high. Programs working at the commercial sector have been very successful. You have someone you can call, you can talk to them, they can reduce their consumption. That's a tried and true thing around the world. But where we are really strong is in small and medium businesses and then residential because we aggregate it en masse. As, as the question was just asked, we get all of the utility data because um, we work for them. And then we send out individual messages to as many people and businesses as possible. So the individual impact is small, but collectively it's massive. Um, who do we inside of those groups do best with? Higher users, so people who are using um, more than four or 500 kilowatt hours a month, they have more to save, so they will save. Also, they oftentimes are not price sensitive because these are more affluent people. Um, and so the price change isn't gonna change their behavior. But when they're told what is normal, what their neighbors are using, they feel a little more motivated to compete. So higher users do very well. But I will tell you it's, it, um, Another moment for me that makes me fascinated is we've run programs in almost 20 countries. We've run programs uh, across various economically uh, developed countries. We have affluent people, people more mo of moderate means. We have people with very high energy costs, people with very low energy costs. We have people with different political viewpoints. Some people care about the environment, climate change, others could not care less. The savings is the same. And I find that heartwarming in a way because everyone will tell you we'll be different here. We can't do it here. Uh, this country's different. It will work in the North. It won't work in the South. Or, you know, whatever people will tell you, shockingly similar. So you need a smart meter to be installed to gather all the data, everything for, uh, to, for you to kind of like tell uh, the changes. Smart meters are a remarkably powerful tool that make our experience even stronger, but we absolutely do not need them. We do need a monthly read. Many places in Europe only read the meter once a year. That's very hard. Um, I'm not sure if that's common here. Uh, but if you have a monthly read, we can do a lot with that. Uh, because we will find out, you can do an audit, a virtual audit of your home on our tools that are available on the website uh, for the utilities. And people will give us so much information. Over 1 million of the 5 million customers um, of one utility 
have voluntarily gone online to fill out an audit. So now we know exactly how large their home is, when they bought their furnace, um, how many people live there. And then we can give you tips because we use our algorithms to determine more and more about it. Smart meters are great, but we don't need them. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Uh, hi, that's fantastic presentation. I have, uh, my question is in two parts. Uh, one is your uh, understanding in working in the Indian environment. Uh, we find that the socio-cultural aspect is pretty dominant in an Indian environment where the data collection has got a direct relationship from which part of the society I come from. And I under, as I understood from your presentation that uh, most of your focus is on where, the, as you rightly said, there's high energy consuming you know, uh, devices or number of devices, which in India is also practically related to the economic status of the household. So you will find the higher the number of gadgets or the utilization is also in the higher economic uh, segment. Uh, and for them, the saving perspective is not really that much of an effect compared to the whole consciousness about actually being green or being carbon neutral or something. So in this context, I find that there is a challenge in India, which could be very different from what the way you have looked at it, let's say uh, evolved societies like US or let's say Europe. Um, and in Indian context, we could def definitely say that it's not necessarily a very uh, divergent society in, in that sense. So how would you look at that future in India? That's number one. Yeah. And number two, uh, what happened? There's so much of data collection that's happening. So what about data security at a personal level? Am I not giving away my behavioral pattern to somebody who's outside uh, sure. my comfort zone? Great, let me answer that first question first. Um, I think that is a theory that is completely reasonable that there may be some issues, but we don't talk about price that much in our communications. So um, I, I'm kind of go off on a tangent for one second. One of my favorite studies I ever read was about a, a preschool. So where you would, you know, um, I don't know if that's the, the term you use, where you take a, a two to five year old before they're enrolled in public school or private school for basically like a daycare type setting where you take your child to be looked after. Um, and they were having problems with uh, parents picking up their children late. And this was a big issue because the staff needed to get home. So um, they were having, uh, of the 20 kids in the program, five or six every day, uh, parents were showing up late. Some of these numbers I'm not remembering exactly, but trust me that it, it's, it's about right. So five or six parents were showing up every day late, 10, 15 minutes. So they put a, a fine. When you show up late, we're going to charge you. So they would charge them. Um, it, was a, it was a fairly nominal fee, but it was a penalty. So they put this out. And what was the outcome? It doubled the number of people who were late because no longer... Was it the social pressure that you show up because you were the bad parent who didn't pick up your kid? Now it's like, here's a dollar, keep watching my kid. And then they got rid of the penalty and it never went back because people had already changed their behavior on it. So we don't use a lot of dollar terminology, particularly because the higher users are typically more affluent, not as worried about um, the, the cost. So we use other behavioral techniques. We help them know how much they used last year versus this year. So they know if they're getting a little out of control. Um, if they use more than what is typical for their size home. And it makes you feel like, oh, what am I wasting? Because humans hate waste. Um, even when they have money, we don't like to waste in general. And so we use a lot of those techniques. Doesn't work for everyone, but most people. Um, so I'm sorry about that tangent, but I thought that might be a helpful story uh, for you to hear. Because people who can afford things still... Um, so uh, social pressure can exert uh, can be exerted. We also rank people sometimes. We let you know how one out of a hundred, you're the seventy fifth, you know, out of a hundred in your energy consumption. You know, a lot of people are very competitive. They don't want to know that they're that bad compared to people in their other neighbors. Your second question: data security. We have a very um, um, specific obligation to serve a utility for a utility purpose. We don't do anything else with the data, but give it back to you. So right now there's data about you, the utility has, you don't get any value from it. We just take that and give it back to you. We don't sell it to anyone. We don't give it to anyone else. Anything that we get from you, like filling out an audit is just for your consumption. So we take it very seriously. 
Um, but this is not financial data. This is not health data. This is about how much energy you use. Uh, we've never had problems uh, deploying programs due to data privacy rules um, anywhere around the world because it is just taking your data and giving it back to you in general. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for your good presentation. I, I would like to ask two, two questions. One is uh, India is having high AT and C losses. And uh, what are the measures you suggest? Apart from many measures are being taken, what are the important measures you suggest to reduce AT and C? Because that is the macro level where you can save the energy. Second question is the smart grids, what we are talking about merely keeping smart meter, it will not serve the uh, demand side management. So uh, consumer demography like India, you have all type of consumers, civilized, uncivilized. How you do the demand side management in the uh, in uh, Indian environment? Okay, so these two part questions, you're expecting me to remember both all the time. <laughs> For the first question, a lot of our tools aren't very well designed for, for dealing with, with those losses. But one thing that we can do is disaggregate usage. And so we can help determine if there's unusual patterns or uh, expectations that are a bit off, if, if appliances are no longer there that used to be there or whatnot. But our tools aren't very well designed for those specific outcomes. Um, and your second question, smart meters, demand side management. Oh, OK. Um, I don't know. Do you do you have a? I'm looking pointing to my colleague. Yeah, yeah. There is a Indian uh, smart grid commission is there already. Fifteen to sixteen projects are being uh, trial run in India. Yeah. So the basic problem is keeping merely smart meter and data collection. It is only for commercial implication. It is useful until yeah. unless the meter serves for the demand side management. You cannot reduce the, you cannot make the load curve flat. Yeah. No, sir, my question is existing appliance, can we have technology to make it as a smart appliance with a domestic environment? Yeah, no hardware. Yeah. But yeah, let me make another point on that though. There's there's a huge um, debate right now about whether or not smart meters are worth the investment. And that's a very reasonable question to ask. Um, obviously for the commercial sector, from the residential sector, um, you know, you have to make a business case for huge investments like this. And so I, I think it's really helpful to think about not, not what we're doing, although that's helpful, but what we need to do with distributed energy resources. If, if people have an electric vehicle, electric bike, um, and if that battery might be able to be plugged in to give power back to the grid, you need a, you need a smart meter. If people, um, if we want to have demand response where we are using or, or collecting, um, using or giving um, energy back to the grid at certain times, there's a huge value in that. If we have rooftop solar that we can pay people for the amount of, of power they're putting back to the grid, there's a lot of other reasons to, to add to the business case for smart metering. Um, and this is just one example of a small thing, but um, there's, there's a lot more to be done. I don't think it's currently being fully assessed in a lot of the, uh, the use cases, which are primarily about, about loss, losses. Oh, yeah, it's all this side. There's one more question. Oh. Okay.
These are great questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, hi, Matt. Uh, I'm Nirmal uh, from OHM. So my question is, uh, in your presentation, you have showed like almost like 50% uh, is utilities and 50% is the vehicle or the, you know, the pollution created by ice vehicles. Now uh, we are talking about the transition where we are saving about the utilities. Whatever we do, it's not more than four or 5% that we can save from any household utility with any kind of, uh, you know, adjustment. But definitely with the vehicles, you can save a lot of lot more. Like, what are your steps towards that? Like, you know, especially in India, if the adaptation in the commercial vehicle side, I mean, if we go into EVs, not only the grid parity will be adjusted, but also in terms of like, you know, uh, the carbon emissions and all. Yeah. So, uh, how are you working towards that? So, I, I wanna um, wanna highlight something. I think after 2040 in the US, this is a different story than what I provided, but it'll be more true here for longer. And this is that electrification of, of vehicles is fantastic, but the grid here still is highly emitting, right? And so this is about right now in the US uh, with the grid that is getting greener and greener um, with near term emissions, you, uh, vehicles are, 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 it's definitely better to be an electric vehicle, but if we can just be efficient, that has a bigger impact on emissions reduction um, than just waiting for the overall grid to be green. Here, I also imagine that reduction efficiency has huge impacts because the grid itself is quite emitting. You, you know, uh, there's a lot of coal here in India and other highly emitting sources. So it's going to be a while until electric vehicles are, they're, they're definitely better than uh, emissions uh, uh, from, from regular vehicles, from ICE vehicles, but it's a it's not, the gap is not as big as it will be as your grid becomes more green. So what those charts were showing is where the emissions reductions can come from, not where emissions currently are. So I don't want to, to, to mistake the two. That makes sense? Great. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Matt. It was a very interesting discussion and it shows how far efficiency and how behavioral change brings in so much of efficiency, completely new thought. Whenever we talk about energy efficiency, we talk about a hardware uh, solution to it. You have brought a completely new perspective to it. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> as a token of thanks for your coming and delivering this lecture, may I request our chairman to hand over the ASCII memento to Matt. And since Mac is here, who is the head of O-Power, let me also make a pitch for uh, our students. We have a PGDM program in which uh, artificial intelligence is one of the specializations and they do a lot of uh, internship and work on power utilities. So we will be very glad if O-Power considers our students uh, for, for placement and you come to our campus for placement. Thank you very much. It was a very nice discussion and a lot of food for thought. Thank you very much for the speech and see you. Thank you. Tea and coffee is served outside. <laughs>